part of you that, uh, that will feel as though this is something that we have in common, and then there's some people who will right away say, that's not me, and that's okay. I have always been, um, I like to go on walks, and, and most of my life, I think I took those walks by myself. Anybody? A few of you? I think it started back, as far as at least I, I recall, it started back because I, I went on, well, it wasn't completely alone in these moments all the time because I had my dog with me. And I, you, you guys, some of you have heard my dog stories. They're woven around Brutus was the name of my dog. Uh, and we went fishing. And so I would go, has anybody here ever fished on Boise Creek? Okay, that's mostly kind of uh, winds around through parts of Enumclaw. Um, some of you, if, if you've ever golfed on the Enumclaw golf course, anybody? No golfers here? Not today. Sometimes you're, if you did, you have a golf ball or two that's in Boise Creek because it goes throughout the golf course. It comes down off of uh, the road that heads up to Chinook Pass and kind of weaves its way through kind of the back countryside where, uh, uh, where I grew up. Past, in fact, how many have been to this? This will help, maybe. King County Fair? Okay, a lot more of you. You don't see it, but it's there in the back, kind of uh, up close to, nestled up close to the mountains. It, it weaves along there and then it comes back down around. It ends up dumping into the White River. But it goes through a bunch of dairies and a whole bunch of other places and farms and it was close enough that I could either walk or ride my bike or later when I could drive, jump in the truck and park that somewhere and then jump out and walk along the river. And if you'd have asked me when I was 16 or 17 years old, where can you catch fish on the Boise Creek? I could have taken you to every single spot that I pretty much ever caught something from the ages of, I don't know, 13 or 14 to 18. Every one of the little twists and turns where there was a pool, and it wasn't a big creek, so wherever it pooled that was big enough that there might be a trout in there somewhere. You may not share that experience at Boise Creek, but how many of you can share that experience, that concept? Okay, now we're together. And in those moments, kind of surveying all the way through these twists and turns, it was an enjoyable thing for me. To try to figure out, like I said, where you could find fish. But it was also contemplative time. Contemplative time before I ever knew who Christ was. But I'd just be thinking about stuff. Working through this space. That idea, though, has carried itself into serving in the church. That concept of going to places and, and being comfortable with walking around. Only now it's not, you know... From 19 years old on, uh, not with Brutus, but with Jesus, and having conversation, and trying to look at or think on whatever I, I felt like I was supposed to be looking at or thinking about, every church that I've ever been at, um, that my family has ever served together at. Same kind of thing. I would be at those facilities or in that city at times when nobody was with me and just kind of walk through and, and look and think about what was going to be built. Or We were either blessed or cursed, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, to have some kind of building project going on almost everywhere we were ever at. In fact, I can't think of a place off the top of my head where we didn't do that. But coming to those places and walking through them and, and just thinking, how does this need to be done? Who needs to be involved? How do we need to recruit who needs to be involved? 
Who can take us from this place to this place and who can take us from that place to wherever is next? How many volunteers will it take? Who needs to be hired? And those conversations, question and answer times were most of the time or a lot of the times just me. It doesn't happen as much here anymore that I can come to this place where there's nobody here but me. Because of the different programs, whether it's uh, the daycare opening their doors early in the morning. Uh, it's tough for me to get here before those doors are opened and they're taking people. Sometimes on Saturdays I get here and there's nobody here and I can, I can walk around then. Or, but most of the time it, when I'm here and I'm by myself, it's because we're closed and it's after word or tomorrow um, when all those different uh, groups are, are not meeting walking around and like I said looking and listening in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 11 it begins this story of, of Nehemiah who's been recruited by family to come back to Jerusalem because the exile is over and the city needs to be rebuilt. And, and in verse 11 and, and several verses later there, it says he comes to the city and he kind of grabs a couple people with him. But in the evening, he goes on horseback because it says I was riding through the city. But he's alone, looking over everything, all the broken parts, all the places that need reparation. He doesn't, he doesn't want anybody to know that this is what he's doing. He's, he's doing it, I think, in response to this sense that, that God has called him into this thing, and he's not sure how it's all going to work out, but he wants to, he wants to get down to the gut level kind of conversation with God about what's next. And so he inventories, in essence, what was there and what wasn't, what's broken, what needs repair, what needs a, a complete restoration. As I'm standing here right now, this is not in my notes. Um, that's not a in my own walks that I was mentioning a few minutes ago, because I think that this is happening with Nehemiah too, is part of that process is looking at the city. I mentioned this kind of last Sunday too, but part of that process is if you're going to have to lead some reparation or rebuilding process, one of the best places to start is looking at your own life experience. Where am I broken? Are there things that I've ignored that need to be rebuilt in my own life? I read a scripture in Proverbs last week and I can't remember, but it basically, uh, Solomon looks at that idea and challenges us as readers to think in those terms where do I need healing where do I need to be rebuilt before I can lead someone else so we see that in Nehemiah like I said chapter 2 verse 11 you can go there and read that some other time and then beginning in chapter 7 after the wall has been rebuilt this kind of quick jump to where we are right now in chapter 7, he commits to the same practice with the people. He, he's, he's identified the wall has these needs, these places that are broken. And, and he's helped the people to develop a plan and an approach to rebuilding this structure of the wall. And then in chapter 7, it's kind of this hinge chapter, if you look at the book of Nehemiah. And now the focus begins to be not this building project, but the people. And in chapter 7, uh, there's a whole lot of names listed. But he kind of starts with this. Chapter 7, verse 5, he writes, again, this is like a journal. 
that he's giving to us. He says, I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. Remember, keep in your head, he is shifting now from the project to the people. So I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. And this is what I found written there. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, from Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, whom, they had, whom had, he had taken captive. These are the people that returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. As I've already mentioned, I, I just have such a, a great respect for this process because I, I think that mostly most of us Is that ambiguous enough? (laughs) Mostly, most of us are good at one or the other. We're good at the building project or we're good at the people project. We identify with the need to meet with broken people or we identify with the need to correct a building issue. But it's a rare person that we find in Nehemiah who brings both of those things together. And says it's the building and it's the people. It shows us an attentiveness to something we're not always comfortable with leaning into. It shows us that he's a listener. It shows us that he he is okay with making hard decisions and sometimes unpopular decisions among the people. And that he'll even stop and and hear from the people as a part of the building process. Uh, Our district superintendent, and I'm pretty sure I've shared this before, he he came to us, uh, um, I don't know, eight months ago. When I say us, it was was, uh, representative uh, pastors and leaders from across the district And he gave us this definition. He was talking about assessing where the church is right now as we are coming out of a pandemic, or actually at that time in the middle of the pandemic, and saying, um, asking this question though, is this representative of just a snowstorm or an ice age? Because if you're a leader, you have to approach those things differently. If it's just a snowstorm, you go, let's stay warm for the next couple days and we'll be fine as soon as the sun comes out again. If it's an ice age, you settle in. And you have to make some hard decisions on on new direction, probably. So he said, here's one definition of leadership. Disappointing people at a rate that they can manage. Because you have to shift gears and do something different. And as I said, that's kind of been our privilege or our burden or our calling or whatever, nearly everywhere we've been. In Mountain Home, we sold a building uh, that they had owned, well, from the inception of the church in Mountain Home. And we bought a grocery store. In Nairobi, it wasn't as much about uh, a new building. We did do some facelift kind of things that Rhonda kind of spearheaded and, and we tried to do. But it was really trying to help a church that met in a, in a big facility, bigger meeting space than this, maybe a, a half again as big as this. And, but there were 18 people the first Sunday we were there. And trying to figure out how to rebuild that family. In Poland, it was, it was the challenge of, of kind of reinventing church in the framework of, of uh, coffee house ministry centers. And those kind of things are full of joy, but they're also full of pain. Amen? Trying to sort through the what's next. It's a great challenge. So when I look at what Nehemiah did in the building of this, this wall, he, it was finished in, anybody remember how many days? 52 days. 52 days. So that's a, that's a great you know, box to be able to check. But now he's looking at the people. And there has to be restoration of the people and redirection for the people. One commentary I read said that less than 2% of those who went to Babylon in the exile returned. Less than 2%. Another listed these reasons. It says several factors were involved in the decision to remain in Babylon. 
Some Jews would have been too old to return because it had been 70 years since the destruction of Jerusalem. And there were many who would have been able, unable to endure the journey of approximately 900 miles. Same would have been true for families with young children and those who were sick or disabled. Some of the Jews probably refused to move due to the comforts of Babylon. Many of them had been born in Babylon during the exile and they knew nothing else. Further, many Jews had attained significant status during the reign of Cyrus. And so they were comfortable where they were. Another reason some Jews would not have returned to Jerusalem was a concern for personal safety. The road to Jerusalem and the land of Judea itself was fraught with peril. In fact, Ezra led those with him in a time of prayer and fasting for safety on their journey. A journey they considered fast because it only took four months. Ezra writes, the hand of our God was on us. And he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. Unfortunately, some Jews were living in disobedience to God at the time. And as a result, they would not have sensed the need to return to Jerusalem. Boy, there's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? I don't feel like I need to return to Jerusalem. And finally, another reason some of the Jews elected not to return was the amount of work that they knew it was going to take to reestablish the nation there. They knew that the city would have to be rebuilt. And it was not an easy challenge to rebuild an entire city, including the city wall. I'm just tired. I'm not really up for that building project. So Leonard Sweet, anybody heard of that name before? Okay, an American theologian. He's also a I think an adjunct professor at Drew Seminary, George Fox Seminary, and other places. He came to speak in, in Switzerland when Rhonda and I and our family were, uh, were there in Poland, in Eastern Europe and other places. And, and so uh, they hosted it at European Nazarene College in Busingen. And we went to see him, and he, this is where I first saw this video, and he talked about how significant and challenging it was to get a group of people to come together to do something new. And so I think the title of this video is called Leadership by a Dancing Man. Lessons from a Dancing Man. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. 
Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit. But you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. <laughs> you really don't know whether to clap for that or not, do you? So let's practice. Everybody's sitting. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that with you. But I do, I do believe a lot of what he says in there, and it's what comes to take shape in this story in Nehemiah, is he stands up and he follows what God has, has asked him to do. He, he begins with this, like I said, walk through, actually ride through the city, and then he begins to focus on the people and the development of, of this whole plan of restoration. The, the greatest comment, though, that I think that comes out of that is, is not how, you know, in essence, it's not the story of how great Nehemiah is, but it's really the story of the unity and the harmony that comes about because he's willing to share this idea and have others be a part. So let's turn in our Bibles now. We'll quick, quick shifting of gears into actual scripture from the dancing guy. Chapter 8, verse 1. You can just follow along with me. Chapter 8, verse 1, it says, All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the teacher of the law. Some commentaries, just kind of side note here, some commentaries hold that, that Ezra was high priest, but others don't. Some maintain that he was just a common scribe or one of the many priests. The name Ezra means God helps, by the way. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel, verse 2. And so on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand he read it out loud from daybreak till noon. Most, uh, again, commentaries believe then that they're reading, this process just of reading is six to seven hours as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of law. By the way, wherever you see that, that is the Torah. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him, on his right, stood Mattathia, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah. I think this has got several... Uh, it's a compound. I'm trying to think of how you pronounce this. I think it's Maaseah. And on his left were Padiah, Misael, Malkiah. And I believe it's Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mesulam. Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above him. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. So let's do that. Everybody stand with me. We're going to read the second half of this. As though we're taking part in this moment. Starting with chapter 8, verse 6. There we go. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 7. The Levites, and I'm just going to say there's 13. Okay. Instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, 
Ezra the priest and the teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord. Let's read that part together really loud, okay? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Verse 12, the last verse here. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. Father, bless this, your reading, our reading of your word, that it would challenge and encourage us today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. You can be seated. I want to talk about this a bit. There are six points, but I'm going to rush through them so that we can be done here. The first one is this. Go back to the very start. Chapter 8, verse 1. It begins with these words. All of the people came together as one. Underline that if, if it's something you can underline, because that's a significant statement. I can't read that without thinking of the scripture in John chapter 17. I think it's, yeah, I have it here, verse 21, where it's Jesus in this moment before his arrest, right? It's, he's praying with the disciples And he's giving them last things for these last moments that he's going to have with them before the arrest. And one of the most important things on his mind or on his heart is to say, I am praying that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. There's a unity Here it comes. There's a unity that runs deeper than any vote that you will cast. (laughs) I could pick that apart for a while. But in our journey of faith, there is a unity that should go beyond any vote that we cast in our government. There is a sense that I belong to you and you belong to me and how I vote is not to be something that pulls me away from you. And when it moves us in that direction, there's an issue that we need to deal with. If we truly believe, well, let me say this, I truly believe That one of the things, and you've heard me talk about this before, that is the enemy's greatest tool is to pry us away from each other. He he starts with husbands and wives, and and, and then he works on parents and kids, and and he also works within church dynamics. He, he, He constantly is trying to find things that will separate us, make us angry with each other, so that we don't have any hope of this concept that Jesus says in 17 verse 21, that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, when we're fighting with each other, those of us who call ourselves family in faith, when we're fighting with each other, man, the world has no hope to believe that we share faith. I'm not saying you should never have dialogue about it. I'm just saying when we get to that place where we're angry, We need to go back and read scripture. Scripture like this. And understand that that process of disunity, that's not a spiritual gift. Paul doesn't list it there. I have the gift of disunity. Well, that's not really there. 
So the question then becomes, what will I allow to come between you and me? Or maybe the other side of this is where we want to go. What can we do together even if we disagree about something? Maybe that's a better question. What can we do together even if we're not on the same page with everything? Oh, I'm not going to get through these unless I hurry. So I'm going to leave that one alone for a second. The other thing that you see in verse 8 is that no one is left behind. Verse 8, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. This insinuates, and the commentaries all agree on this, because the group that has now come together has a whole lot of different life experiences that there were probably interpreters in the room. Because not, all, not everybody even spoke the same language, even though that they were united as a culture, and maybe not fully practiced culture, but they were still united in their ancestry, they, they didn't all speak the same language. So the assumption here is that there were people within this whole dynamic who are helping everybody to understand in the language that they most understood. Nobody is left behind. A couple thoughts here too, as it says... In Ezra's accounting of this story, there is also mention made that the children were in attendance. And so culturally and generationally, effort was made for everyone to participate and to understand as much as possible what was happening and what was being read to them. A British Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner writes, The law had always been envisaged, I'm sorry, envisaged as a wise and understanding people taught from childhood not only the words of God, but what the words and the rituals meant. In other words, don't just do this. Do this because. This is the historical representation and and from childhood on. So the priests are making sure this happened. The next thing I just wanted to touch on is the first part of verse 9. Leadership is one voice. It tells us that, that Nehemiah has been working with Ezra. So Nehemiah the governor, it says, and then Ezra, whether he was high priest or not, and then the Levites, which is the rest of the priests, they're all in the same kind of place. Three layers of leadership mentioned here, working together in step. That doesn't mean that they always agreed on everything, but in this big picture concept, they were all together. I'm just guessing that they, you know, 13 13 Levites that were mentioned and two others, Nehemiah and Ezra, they probably didn't agree on everything. But in the big picture concept of what they're trying to achieve here, they're all in step. They all agree. Fourth in your outline, within this commitment, God anoints. Just You can skip past this and miss something, I think, that's really important. Go to verse 9 for a second. After uh, the second half there, it says uh, that Ezra and Nehemiah, they were instructing. And then it says, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So back up for just a second. Those first three things. There's a unity that runs deeper than any vote you cast. And no one is left behind. And leadership is together in this conceptually. And within that moment... I I find this just amazing. All they have been doing is instructing or reading from the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, exciting. (laughs) Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, not so much. Nonetheless, at hearing the reading of this, people are broken and weeping. That's astonishing to me. It doesn't say that they got up there and and in this amazing ability to verbalize everything that's happening, the people were just torn asunder emotionally. They couldn't hardly stand it because the anointing of the Holy Spirit was... It doesn't say anything on, on Ezra as he spoke. It doesn't say anything about that. It just says that they read. And people were weeping. They were so moved. That just speaks to me about this idea that within this moment, there was a group identity. It kind of goes back to our dancing man thing in a a way. 
where they were just saying, hey, we're all together, we need to continue to move together, and we know that deep in our heart, deep enough that all you got to do is read from God's Word, and it's going to take us apart. I think that this is the fruition of a prayer request that goes all the way back for Nehemiah to chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, where he identifies as the leader. If you read that prayer, which I just encourage you to do that if you've never done that before, but it comes back to this place where he is so broken himself as a leader about what's happening to the people and to his hometown that he weeps and mourns. And, and he comes to God and he just says, please help us. And so now they're finally together. This is the first time it's mentioned. Now they're finally together. And, and it's kind of the fruition, like I said, of Nehemiah's being willing to just be raw before God. And so in that moment, the people don't have to have the right music. It doesn't mention the worship team. They're just reading from the Torah. And people are, are hearing and understanding their own need to come before God and just say, as a group, help us. I think that's such an important thing for us to remember because we live in such a consumer society when it comes to church. And it's like, who has the best preaching? Or who has the best programming? Or who has the best worship? Or who has the best whatever? Let's go there. And I, and I understand that, believe me. I mean, I, man, I don't like to listen to people who don't inspire me talk. I don't like to listen to music that isn't well put together. But I have to kind of look in the mirror when I take those things and, and then shut the door just because I don't think that they're as, as good at those things as I wish that they were. Can God still speak to us today just by us reading his word? I think the answer is yes. But the practical application it requires a being in tune that I'm not, only, I'm not always there yet. Fifth in your outline, um, I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come to the platform here. But fifth in your outline is, is something we've repeated several times. It's share the hope, be the blessing, and look for the beauty. In verse 12, let me go back there. It says, all the people went away to eat and drink. And here's the part that is the sharing part. To send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy. That's a really quick phrase in there, but what it tells us is, is that people there realized that there were other folks who couldn't be here who needed to celebrate with us this moment. And so they send it away. The, the Hebrew there is an active, like, pushing away. I won't receive it at all. I'm going to push it on. I'm going to Pay it forward, so to speak. There's some blessings that we will never receive in the church unless we learn how to do that. It's going to require us going, I'm not even going to take that home with me. Because I already have that. Or I don't need that as much as somebody else I know. And so I'm going to send it their way. And then the last thing is kind of stepping back here. Celebrate the victories versus uh, just verse 10a. Go there for a second. Just underline this part. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy. I love it that he said that. Go and enjoy. And he, I think, says that because he knows how difficult this process has been for his people. So just go and enjoy. Will you just go and enjoy? <laughs> I'm going to say that to you when we leave today. Just go and enjoy. Because the work has been hard. It's been hard physically. It's been hard mentally, emotionally. So just go and enjoy. I think that that's a challenge for us 
again, as a really accomplished leader that we see Nehemiah to be, to remind the people of just the need to celebrate, enjoy accomplishments, inspire and encourage one another. We're going to sing in just a few minutes, but I had asked a couple people who came up to me last Sunday, um, and I'm going to see, where did I see Katrina? Katrina, can you come up here for a second? I asked last Sunday if there were people here who, uh, I'm going to ask you to come up here, who uh, had some stories of of how... uh, how God had kind of interrupted their life, um, got in the middle of some things and took them in a direction. And, and, uh, and Katrina was sure that she couldn't share. And then she told me everything at the, at the rear of the sanctuary. So I asked her to come up and she told me, I'm just going to preface this just a little bit, but that the first Sunday I said that something happened and then she kind of held that Um, And then this last Sunday, when I mentioned that again, she knew that she needed to tell me. So how has God interrupted? So I'll just start from the beginning. A couple months ago, I received a text message from a coworker that had a picture uh, at the front door of the place I work with somebody sleeping at the front door. Didn't think too much about it because where we work, there's people that are sleeping in our parking lot all the time. I, when I arrived at work, the police were there trying to get this person to leave. Um, it took a while, but that gentleman ended up just staying outside on the sidewalk all day long. Normally, I wouldn't think too much about it. I sit at my desk. I don't really run too many errands or anything. But that day, a coworker asked me to go across the street to McClendon's with her just to purchase some screws. That's nothing I need to do. I always say no. I always stay at my desk and work because there's going to be 10 more emails that pop up that are going to be there when I get back. I decided that day I was going to walk over to McClendon's to buy some screws with her. On the way back, I looked at the man who's still out on the sidewalk. I mean, this is... I mean, past lunchtime. He's been out there all day. He's got his table set up. He's listening to music, just having a good old time. I made eye contact, and I realized, I think I know this man. It took me a while to figure out if I really did. We approached him and asked his name. I'm not going to say his name, but... He told us his name. Turns out that man was my cousin. He's homeless. He's been living on the streets off and on for 14 years. Later that day, after work, I went out and I spent an hour talking to him, trying to get him to go get help. He doesn't belong on the streets. He's not ready. I left that day after taking him some food and hoped that he wouldn't be there when I got there in the morning. He was. He was sleeping on the sidewalk. Later that afternoon, I saw another man out there zipping up a duffel bag. I thought nothing of it, and a coworker said to me, that man is stealing his stuff. So I immediately ran out. We approached the other man, got some of his stuff back, after arguing and we went on our way well actually I tried to get my cousin to wake up because he had no idea this man was stealing his stuff because he was passed out later on that evening or actually later on that day my cousin was so upset over this man that had stolen his stuff because one of the items he stole was his cell phone so now he has no communication Uh, so he was throwing stuff all over. I went out. I stayed out there for probably an hour with him, holding a trash bag, making him clean up the mess that he'd made. After work, I spent two hours out there with him, just talking and listening. During that two hours, 
the man that had stolen his stuff earlier in the day came back. That man said to me, I thought, you probably thought you'd never see me again. You're right, I didn't. That man said, God told me to bring his stuff back. And in that was his cell phone. So now he has his communication back. He didn't bring all his stuff back, but he got his cell phone back. Uh, I, again, left thinking, I hope I never see him out here again. He was still there. He'd moved maybe 100 feet under the bridge. Uh, I took him some lunch that day, but I, I've tried talking to him. He needs help. He's definitely not ready. He does not think that he has any other choice but to be on the streets. He does. He does not have to be homeless. He has money. He could afford a place to live. He's choosing to be out on the streets because he thinks that's where he belongs. I can't, I, I don't know what else to do to help him other than listen and talk when I see him out there. I have seen him a couple times since. His mom, my aunt, um, actually showed up at my place of work uh, a couple weeks ago and we found him. He was close by, so we spent a little bit of time with him. Um, but it's just sad that he really thinks there's, there's nothing, uh, I mean, there's nothing else he can do. That's, that's where he thinks he belongs, is on the streets. Um, he has excuses for everything. Um, nothing is his fault, but um, I mean, I know the story doesn't end there. I'll keep continuing to try to get him help. Thank you. Thank you. Let's stand. Would you mind coming right down here? And if you would like to come and, uh, and surround uh, Katrina at this point to, to pray. She didn't share his name, and that's fine. Uh, the thing that I shared with Katrina last Sunday was just that um, she said, I don't know what to do. And I don't know that um, any of us right here right now know this is what needs to be done but we know from whom our help comes and so there can be some helps that Katrina is not aware of I didn't tell her just come to church next Sunday and we'll fix this that's that's beyond me I, but it's not beyond our God and so I would like if we could have maybe a, a person uh, who would specifically pray for her right now. And if I could hand you the mic.